Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've had another car crash interview on BBC News. But car crash for BBC News, not the person being interviewed. This is uh, the British barrister Natasha Hausdorff, uh, who decided to go on BBC News to educate the BBC viewers and also the BBC presenter. Uh, and of course, uh, very subtly and logically expose uh, the problems with the whole narrative. Uh, that is apparently everything's the fault of the Jews and Israel. Let's go to this interview in case you haven't seen it. It's beautiful. Well, we can now speak to Natasha Hausdorff. She's a barrister and international law expert. Um, I was just wondering if I could ask you from a legal perspective, how does, do governments go about trying to negotiate uh, the release of these hostages? What concessions could be offered, even though we've been told in this case none, none were? H how would it work? Um, the international law aspects of this are, of course, extremely important, and, and myths about Israel's conduct about international law have been playing a significant role uh, in this crisis uh, and in the coverage of it. Uh, and perhaps I can be clear that from an international law perspective, Israel does not only have the right to a robust response, but under the Convention on the Prevention and the Punishment of Genocide, the crime of genocide, it also has an affirmative obligation, like the rest of the signatories to that convention, to make sure that never again means never again. Well, as you say, under international law, Israel has the right to defend itself. As we've been saying, these uh, attacks uh, orchestrated by Hamas inside Israel two weeks ago today were unprecedented. We're talking about a massacre as well as hostage taking of people, including women and children. Also under international law, though, as well as the right to defend yourself as a party, uh, you, there are also rules of war and engagement. So it's not that you can't defend yourself. It's how you defend yourself in the situation. In this case, how Israel defends itself. And there's been a lot of concentration. We've been talking about aid today. The plight of Palestinian civilians on the ground, uh, that siege that's been tightened on the Gaza Strip until today. No food, no water, no medical no. supplies, aerial bombardments day and night and aimed, Israel says, at Hamas and Hamas infrastructure. But the number of casualties amongst civilians has been very, very high. Well, let me pick up, if I may, on those points in turn. In compliance with its obligations under international law to minimize civilian casualties, Israel is issuing warnings of where it will be striking Hamas terrorist infrastructure. It's a practice used by all law-abiding countries. It is telling them to leave in order to try to save their lives. And, of course, there has also been mass evacuation of Israeli civilians from the north and south of Israel, away from the borders with terrorist organizations. But there is another myth here, that Israel has an obligation to supply Hamas terrorists with electricity and other goods, and that is without basis in international law. Israel is not required to fund or assist Hamas war efforts as it attempts to butcher Jews. Uh, and of course, since Hamas violently seized control in 2007, Israel has continued to provide a part of uh, Gaza's fuel, uh, electricity, water, uh, and also medical care to Palestinian civilians that Hamas neglects and abuses. That isn't viable during a military campaign where Hamas exploits these transfers, stealing supplies and penetrating humanitarian organizations to mask its terror uh, operations and to launder funds. And Hamas uses the electricity grid in Gaza to continue to fire missiles onto Israeli civilians. That firing has continued in the course of the last hour and, and your broadcasts. And of course, some of these rockets from Gaza uh, fall short as we saw with the Al-Ali hospital car park. Uh, in the case of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, a third of the rockets fired in the last exchange of theirs fell short, killing many Gazan civilians. Uh, but I must stress in relation to your question, there is no requirement to provide resources. International law only requires that Israel facilitate the passage of food and medicine by third parties, if such goods can be reliably delivered without diversion to Hamas. And we know that is not the case because Hamas controls Gaza. And in fact, the basic rules outlined by the Geneva and the Hague Conventions are, are, are that sieges are lawful unless they are deliberately aimed at starving the local population. The IDF has been repeatedly clear about its objectives, 
defeating Hamas, establishing a new reality in Gaza where Israel doesn't face a genocidal terror organization that has uh, the will or capability to attack Israeli civilians and rescuing the hostages. Uh, and if governments and international organizations... And Natasha Hausdorff, if I could, sorry, if I could just, if I could just interrupt you there, sorry, uh, just a moment, Natasha Hausdorff, sorry to interrupt you, but you've made um, a, a number of points very clearly uh, from your perspective. Uh, as you say, under international law, and I, unlike you, I am not an international uh, lawyer. Uh, Israel in this case, or it, it is it, it is allowed by parties under international law, if they can argue their reasons why, to have a siege. But what is not allowed under international law is something that is alleged by uh, aid agencies, for example, and they say that what the, the effect on Palestinian civilians stuck inside Gaza, they say, seems like collective punishment seems like collective punishment, they say. Collective punishment is not allowed under international law. Of course, all of these legal uh, questions are hotly contested. Uh, well, it's flatly um, not borne out by the facts on the ground. And if these aid organizations are um, invested in uh, the interests of Gazan civilians, then they should devote their resources to facilitating the safe and rapid evacuation of Gazan civilian population to the south which Hamas has been uh, seeking to hamper with reports of it bombing fleeing civilians. But you, the allegation that you have uh, raised, um, Katya, is a, a re reprehensible moral equivalence. Um, and it has been drawn, uh, it is utterly morally repugnant. Uh, it also attaches, of course, to the suggestion of, of proportionality in international law, uh, that that is um, about comparing casualty figures. And, and that is also not correct. Um, every strike that uh, Israel takes, every military action is weighed up, it is analyzed to make sure that according to international law, the anticipated collateral damage, the harm to civilians, is proportionate to the military aims of a strike, a strike that is militarily necess necessary uh, and legitimately targets terrorist infrastructure. So these uh, suggestions of collective punishment um, are morally reprehensible liable. Um, as Natasha Hausdorff, you say that uh, these allegations aren't borne out by facts on the ground. It is objective bodies such as the International Criminal Court, for example, uh, who are brought up um, in times of conflict to examine situations and every single individual case about whether the rules of law or engagement were respected in individual particular uh, cases. But we thank you very much for your time uh, this morning for joining us. Natasha Hausdorff there, uh, international lawyer, barrister who also advises UK uh, lawyers inside um, Israel. Did you see at the end, uh, make sure to scroll back if you didn't notice uh, Natasha's face uh, because at the end when <laughs> you had the previous presenter Adler uh, decided to talk nonsense again. So Natasha wanted to have her time to respond to the last bit. This is exactly what they do, by the way, the mainstream media, the likes of BBC, Sky and all the others. So they have, they have a reasonable debate with you. They ask you questions. And then at the end, when they're not too happy about their own performance, if, if they feel that you've said too much, that they don't like, it goes against the narrative. You know what they do? They say, okay, perfect. So this is, uh, this is the response. And then thank you for coming. And then they have the last word. They say something that you have to respond to, but you can't because the show's finished. The interview is over. They say basically, oh, what you said, just evil. Israel and Jewish people are evil. But anyway, Natasha, thank you so much for coming on the show. Bye. This is exactly what they do. But the good thing about what Natasha did in this interview was um, you had political debates, I talk about it, you, know, you guys talk about it on this channel, um, and, but this is a logical response. This is actually about debunking the legal claims, international law obligations and everything else, the proportionality of the response. So this isn't really a political argument um, in favor of Palestine or Israel. This is absolutely needed uh, for you guys if you want to uh, debate with someone, and if they're just talking nonsense about their, their fake news of this conflict, show them this clip. Just show them uh, the responses uh, that we've got from an actual lawyer uh, who knows what she's talking about. Let me, know. Let me know what you think in the comment section. I'm Maya Tusi and we are the media.